All right, good evening. Thanks everyone for joining. The first question we're going to look at this evening is what is the difference between being baptized by the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2 and 1 Corinthians 12, 13? So when you, when you think about the dispensational chart, we of course understand that the Bible is a book of progressive revelation, meaning that information is revealed sequentially over time. Any movie that you've ever watched, any book that you've ever read, operates on the basis of progressive revelation, meaning that you don't know on page one what you're going to know at the end of the story. That's the way everything in life works. Well, the same thing is true with us in the scriptures. And so what we're going to look at tonight is the difference between how the Holy Spirit operates in Acts chapter 2, right after Pentecost, and then in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, which is how the Holy Spirit operates during the dispensation of grace. So turn with me, if you would, to Matthew 3, verse 11. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 3 and verse 11. Matthew 3, 11. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear, he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. So what John the Baptist is saying in Matthew 3, 11 is that when he refers to he that cometh after me is mightier than I, he's obviously referring to the Lord Jesus Christ. And he says that the Lord Jesus Christ will baptize you with the Holy Ghost. Get Mark 1, verse 8. Mark chapter 1 and verse 8. I indeed have baptized you with water, but he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost. Luke 3, 16. Luke chapter 3 and verse 16. John answered, saying unto them all, I indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than I cometh, the latchet of whose shoes I am not worthy to loose. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. And then get John 1, 33. John chapter 1 and verse 33. <clears throat> and I knew him not, but he that sent me to baptize with water, the same said unto me, Upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, the same is he which baptizeth with the Holy Ghost. And so that's a reference to the Lord Jesus Christ is going to be the one upon whom the Spirit descends. So what we saw in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is that John the Baptist, and just to look at the, the time frame here, you can see where John the Baptist is before the cross. He prophesies and indicates that the Lord Jesus Christ is going to baptize with the Holy Ghost. But what we want to see next is that the baptism of the Holy Ghost did not occur during the Lord's earthly ministry. So get John 14, verse 26. So multiple verses in the Gospels predict and, and indicate that the Lord will baptize with the Holy Ghost but that baptism does not occur during the Lord's earthly ministry. So John 14, 26. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. So in John 14, the Lord is talking about the sending of the Holy Ghost being a yet future event. Now notice John 16, verse 7. John chapter 16 and verse 7. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. Well, in John 16, 7, who is the Comforter? It's the, it's the Holy Ghost. It's the same thing as John 14, 26. And what the Lord says about the Comforter is that the Comforter won't be sent unless the Lord goes away. So the Comforter cannot be sent before what event? Before the cross, right? Because the Lord has to go away and then he will send the Comforter. Look at Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1. 
and we'll look at verse 5, Acts 1, 5. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. Meaning in John or in Acts 1, 5, the baptism with the Holy Ghost had not happened yet, but it was about to. Look with me at Acts 2, 38. Acts chapter 2, verse 38. Then said Peter unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Under the kingdom gospel, water baptism was required as an expression of faith. In Acts 2.38, if someone was water baptized, what would they then receive as the evidence of their faith? And the, the Holy Spirit, right? The Holy Ghost would be given in response to water baptism in faith. Now, what we're doing here is we're focusing on, we saw during the Lord's earthly ministry from John the Baptist all the way up to the cross, the Holy Ghost had not yet been given. In Acts 2, the Holy Ghost is given. This entire time frame, everything that we're looking at before the dispensation of grace is part of time past. I want to show you some things about how the Holy Spirit operated in time past. So get with me 1 Samuel chapter 10, verse 6. So you're going all the way back to 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel chapter 10, and we're going to look at verse 6. What we're going to do is we're going to look at some verses here that will show us how the Holy Spirit interacted with man at that time. So 1 Samuel 10, verse 6, And the Spirit of the Lord will come upon thee, and thou shalt prophesy with them, and shalt be turned into another man. And this is a reference to the Holy Spirit coming upon King Saul. Turn forward a few chapters, 1 Samuel 16, verse 14. 1 Samuel chapter 16 and verse 14. But the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord troubled him. So in 1 Samuel 10, Samuel says to Saul that the Holy Spirit is going to come upon him. But what happens six chapters later? The Holy Spirit departs. One of the realities of the way the Holy Spirit functioned in time past, before the dispensation of grace, is the Holy Spirit came upon people, but then sometimes it would leave. Notice with me Psalm 51, verse 11. <coughs> Psalm 51, and we'll look at verse 11. <laughs> Psalm 51 and verse 11. Now, Psalm 51 <coughs> is a psalm of David. Notice what verse 11 says. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. So what David does in Psalm 51 is he prays, take not thy Holy Spirit from me. That is a reasonable prayer to pray in time past because can the Holy Spirit be taken from someone? Yes, it can, as demonstrated by what happened with King Saul. We're in the Old Testament. Now let's flip forward to Hebrews chapter 6, verse 4. So we're going to go almost all the way to the end of the New Testament. Get Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 4. <clears throat> now to understand what we've done here, we've gone from looking at the time <clears throat> of around King David, and we're going all the way forward now to look at ages to come to understand how the Holy Spirit operates at that time. 
the way that the Holy Spirit operates in the 70th week here is going to be consistent with how it operated in early Acts. So you're, if you have Hebrews 6 verse 4, go ahead and look at it with me. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost. And so when Hebrews 6, 4 refers to people being made partakers of the Holy Ghost, I believe that's a reference to what we saw in Acts 2, 38, where someone believes the kingdom gospel and they receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So look at verse 5. And have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come, if they shall fall away to renew them again unto repentance. Now in verses 4 to 6, it may be hard to follow because it's removed by a bunch of words. But verse 4 says, for it is impossible, and then it talks about these folks. Verse 6, if they shall fall away to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucified themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. What Hebrews 6 is saying is that under the kingdom program, if someone falls away, so they're in the faith, this is under the kingdom program, and they fall away, it is impossible to renew them again under repentance. In other words, they, they, they lose their salvation. Look with me at Hebrews 10, verse 26. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 26. For if we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation, which shall devour the adversaries. So what verse 26 talks about is folks receive the knowledge of the truth, but after they receive it, if they sin willfully, then what they have to expect is only one thing, and verse 27 calls it a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation. In other words, that's the, the destruction of hell is what that is. Verse 28, He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Verse 29, Of how much sorer punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy, who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God, and hath counted the blood of the covenant, wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing, now notice this, and hath done despite unto the Spirit of grace. So verse 29 refers to the blood of the covenant, wherewith he was sanctified, referencing, I believe, someone who is saved under the kingdom gospel. But then the end of the verse says, and hath done despite unto the Spirit of grace. The idea there is that someone uh, would have believed the kingdom gospel, and as a result of believing the kingdom gospel, they would be baptized by the Holy Spirit. But if they commit a willful sin, it says there that they have done despite under the Spirit of grace. And if they do that, then what happens to them? Destruction under the kingdom gospel. Now, let's be clear on this. That's not the way that things work today. We're going to talk about that in just a minute. But I want you to think through this with me just for a moment. <clears throat> Can you think of anyone in the scriptures that has done despite unto the spirit of grace and lost their salvation? Well, Judas never had the Holy Spirit, right? Because he's before Acts 2. So you got to think about someone that would be after Acts 2, but under the kingdom program, right? Maybe someone like Ananias and Sapphira. So look at me at Acts 5. Look at me at Acts chapter 5. If you've ever wondered, does the punishment of Ananias and Sapphira seem... Harsh, because what Ananias and Sapphira do, of course, is under the, starting in Acts 2, 
what the kingdom church did is they sold all that they had and they had all things common. People call that communism, but it's, 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 not, it's not communism because communism is enforced at the barrel of a gun, right? In other words, it's a government mandate. What's going on in Acts 2 is not, is not communism. But what's happened, what happens in Acts 2 is the Holy Spirit enabled believers to, to live that way. But notice with me Acts 5 verse 1. But a certain man named Ananias with Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession and kept back part of the price, his wife also being privy to it. So they, they agreed in this conspiracy and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. Verse 3, but Peter said, Ananias, why hath Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the price of the land? So the sin that's described here in Acts chapter 5 verse 3 is... Lying to the Holy Ghost, that's what the verse says. Verse 5, And Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and gave up the ghost. So there was immediate judgment here, isn't there? There's no forgiveness that's offered. There's no repentance. There's judgment, and he's killed. Now, notice verse 8. Let's start in verse 7. It was about the space of three hours after when his wife, not knowing what was done, came in. So she wasn't aware. And Peter answered unto her, Tell me whether ye sold the land for so much. And she said, Yea, for so much. Then Peter said unto her, How is it that ye have agreed together to tempt the Spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of them which have buried thy husband are at the door and shall carry thee out. Then fell she down straightway at his feet and yield up the ghost. And the young man came in and found her dead and carrying her forth, buried her by her husband." I would suggest you that's, a, that's an example of when you think about the, the verses uh, under the kingdom program about sinning against the Holy Spirit, the clearest example you can find is Acts chapter 5 with Ananias and Sapphira. When they lie to the Holy Ghost, when they tempt the Holy Ghost, what happens? It's immediate judgment, right? There's no forgiveness or anything like that uh, because that's the way the Holy Spirit operated under the kingdom program with folks that have been baptized by the Holy Spirit. Now, does that work that way today? I mean, it, it obviously doesn't work that way today. So, look with me then at uh, 1 Corinthians 12, verse 13. Now, so far, everything we have looked at has been about how the Holy Spirit operated under the kingdom program. We're now going to look at how the Holy Spirit operates during the dispensation of grace. So 1 Corinthians 12, verse 13. For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one spirit. So when someone believes the gospel today, what the Holy Spirit does is it spiritually places that individual into the body of Christ. The Spirit baptizes you into the body of Christ, in other words, into the church that God is forming today. Every believer on earth is a, is a member of the body of Christ. Look with me at 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 21. 2 Corinthians 1 and verse 21. Now he which establisheth us with you in Christ and hath anointed us is God. Verse 22. Who hath also sealed us and given the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts. So that says that we've been given the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts as believers. The word earnest is, is most frequently used in the sense of earnest money or a down payment. It's something that is given at the outset as a guarantee of future performance. In 2 Corinthians 1, it's not us giving an earnest to God. It's God giving an earnest to us. <clears throat> and it, <clears throat> excuse me, 
It's God giving the Holy Spirit as an earnest, as a guarantee of what God is going to accomplish in the future. Look with me at Ephesians 1, verse 13. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13. In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. So when someone believes the gospel today, they are sealed by the Holy Spirit. Now notice this, verse 4, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession under the praise of His glory. So the believer is sealed by the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit is given as an earnest of our inheritance. So the idea there is when you, when you make an earnest money deposit, yeah, or what we would call a down payment, you make that up front, and it's very small in comparison to the total purchase price. It's a fraction of it, right? So what God does with the believer is the moment you believe the gospel, you're given the Holy Spirit as an earnest, and that indicates two things. Number one, it's a guarantee of what God's going to accomplish in the future. Is God going to fail to do what He promised, and therefore you get to keep the Holy Spirit as a forfeiture because He backed out of the deal? I mean, that's just not... It's not reasonable. He's not, that's not going to happen. But it's also an indication that what God is going to do for you in the future must be truly extraordinary if the earnest, if, you know, if the small upfront payment is the giving of the Holy Spirit. So get with me Romans chapter 8 and verse 23. Romans chapter 8 verse 23. Romans 8, verse 23. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. So we have the first fruits of the Spirit. Again, it's a similar concept to the earnest. It's the initial, initial fruit. And the idea here is that we are waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. So when a believer gets sealed, they're sealed the moment they have faith by the Holy Spirit, and they're sealed unto the redemption of the body that occurs at the rapture. Get with me Ephesians 4 verse 30. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 30. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God. The reason why it says to grieve not the Holy Spirit of God is a believer today, the Holy Spirit indwells us. So as we live our lives, the Holy Spirit is present with us during that time. So every time that we sin, the Holy Spirit is there like really not interested in it right? It grieves the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit, of course, is holy. Now, notice the last part of the verse, and grieve not the Holy Spirit, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. You're sealed unto the rapture. Now, if you put all those verses together, those verses teach very strongly that the believer has eternal security today. People sometimes have the idea, well, I believe the gospel, I believe Christ died for my sins, was buried, and rose again the third day. But then I have to do a bunch of work, and I have to, do, I have to keep believing, and I have to do this and that. and I have to do all these various things in order to maintain my salvation. And if I fail to do those things, then I'll lose my salvation. But if you pay attention to what we've looked at, when someone believes the gospel, they are given the Holy Spirit as an earnest well, if they're given the Holy Spirit as an earnest, is it possible for them to lose their salvation? If they are sealed unto the day 
of redemption. So if you're sealed from the moment you believe until the rapture, how, it, there's nowhere where you can lose your salvation because it takes you from here all the way up to when you will be in heaven with the Lord. So what I want you to notice then is this. Does the Holy Spirit operate the same way under the kingdom program as it does during the dispensation of grace? So you guys recall under the kingdom program, David prays, take not thy Holy Spirit from me. And he prayed that, among other reasons, Saul had the Holy Spirit taken from him. So it's possible under the kingdom program to lose the Holy Spirit. You can't lose the Holy Spirit during the dispensation of grace because the Holy Spirit is given as an earnest by God of what God is going to do in the future. And the Holy Spirit seals you under the day of redemption. That's why the Old Testament never calls the Holy Spirit an earnest and never says that they're sealed because they're not. In fact, can people under the kingdom program be water baptized, receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and then sin against the Holy Spirit and lose their salvation? Well, that's what happened to Ananias' and Sapphira, right? They tempted the Spirit of the Lord. They lied to the Holy Ghost, and since they weren't sealed, since the Holy Spirit wasn't given to them as an earnest, what happened in Acts 5 is judgment fell upon them. Now, do you and I need to worry about that today? No, not at all. But, but the point simply is this. God deals with man differently at different points in time. God himself never changes. God in his character, in his holiness, in his righteousness, in his graciousness, and so on, he, he, he never changes. I am the Lord, I change not. But does his dealings with sinful man change over time? And the answer is that his dealings do. And so when you study an issue like the Holy Spirit, you need to be mindful, where am I on the timeline? You know, am I in time past? Am I in but now, which is today, the dispensation of grace, or am I in ages to come? And it's, it's important to know where you are on the chart because there are differences in, in God's program, in God's economy for man at different points in time. We'll go on to the next question now. Get with me Matthew 26. <clears throat> Matthew 26, verse 6. This question is, was the Lord anointed with expensive ointment more than once? <clears throat> and what's going on in, 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 with this question is, in each of the four Gospels, the Lord is anointed with oil. And the question is, are these four different events or are they the same event? So look at Matthew 26, verse 6. Now when Jesus was in Bethany, in the house of Simon the leper, there came unto him a woman having an alabaster box of very precious ointment and poured it on his head as he sat at meat. But when the disciples saw it, they had indignation saying, to what purpose is this waste? For this ointment might have been sold for much and given to the poor. When Jesus understood it, he said unto them, why trouble ye the woman? For she hath wrought a good work upon me. For ye have the poor always with you, but me ye have not always. For in that she hath poured this ointment on my body, she did it for my burial. Verily I say unto you, wheresoever this gospel shall be preached in the whole world, there shall also this, that this woman hath done, be told for a memorial of her. And so you can see that there's this event that takes place in the house of Simon the leper, where the Lord is anointed with an alabaster box of ointment. So let's then compare that. Get Mark 14, verse 3. Mark chapter 14, verse 3. This is an account of another anointing, and let's take a look at it and see if it's the same thing or something else. So Mark 14, verse 3. And being in Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, 
as he sat at meat, there came a, a woman having an alabaster box of ointment of spikenard, very precious, and she broke the box and poured it on his head. And there were some that had indignation within themselves and said, why was this waste of the ointment made? For it might have been sold for more than 300 pence and have been given to the poor. And they murmured against her. And Jesus said, let her alone. Why trouble ye her? She hath wrought a good work on me. For ye have the poor with you always, and whensoever ye will, ye may do them good. But me ye have not always. She hath done what she could. She has come aforehand to anoint my body to the burying. Verily I say unto you, wheresoever this gospel shall be preached throughout the whole world, this also that she hath done shall be spoken of for a memorial of her. So let me ask you this. Is this a different event or is this the same event? It's very clearly the same event, right? Both of them occur in Bethany. Both occur in the house of Simon the leper. The, it's, both are, are, are said to be an alabaster box. So, okay, so very, it's the same event, right? Now, even though it's the same event, there are some details that are different. So we see in, in Mark 14, verse 5, that it talks about how it could have been sold for more than 300 pence. So it's the same event, but there are some supplemental details. But obviously, it's the same event. Get John 12, verse 1. So, so far, Matthew and Mark are referring to the same event. Let's now try John 12, verse 1. John chapter 12, verse 1. Then Jesus, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, which had been dead, whom he raised from the dead. There they made a, him a supper, and Martha served, but Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table with him. Then took Mary a pound of ointment of spikenard, very costly, and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the odor of the ointment. Then saith one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, which should betray him, why was this ointment, why was not this ointment sold for 300 pence and given to the poor? This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the bag and bare what was put therein. Then said Jesus, let her alone. Against the day of my burying hath she kept this. For the poor always ye have with you, but me ye have not always. So is this the same event or is this a different event? I'm going to go with same. Now, why do I say that? Well, this one occurs in Bethany as well. Uh, it has spikenard as well, but does it have some new details? It does. We, we learn that the name of the woman is Mary, and we learn that the name of the disciple who was upset is Judas. Uh, so I think it's the same event, unless there's two of these that occur in Bethany involving spikenard. So I'm going to say that these are all, these three are all the same event. But get with me Luke chapter 7, verse 36. Luke chapter 7, verse 36. And while you're turning there, let me just list some other similarities. Uh, all three of those occurred in Bethany. All three of those have the same murmuring about why the ointment was not sold. All three of them have the same statement about the anointing being done in preparation for burial. Uh, they're all in Bethany. So it seems to me, you know, without 100% certainty, but it seems to me those three are all about the same event. Let's now look at Luke 7, verse 36. And one of the Pharisees desired him that he would eat with him. And he went into the Pharisee's house and sat down to meet. And behold, a woman in the city, which was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at meat in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box of ointment, and stood at his feet behind him, weeping, and began to wash his feet with tears, and did wipe them with the hairs of her head, and kissed his feet, and anointed them with the ointment. Now when the Pharisee which had bidden him saw it, he spake within himself, saying, This man, if he were a prophet, would have known who and what manner of woman this is that toucheth him, 
for she is a sinner. Now, is this event the same as the other three? It's not, right? There's, there's a bunch of things here that are different. First of all, he's going into the Pharisee's house. All the other times he was going into the house of Simon the leper. Uh, here, what's going on, there's nothing said about why was this not sold and given to the poor. Uh, and so th this event seems to be a different one. Let, let me pull together why this is relevant. <clears throat> one of the things that, that Scripture does, one of the basic ways, one of the basic methods you use to understand Scripture is to compare verse with verse. So when, when God put in Matthew, Mark, and, and John three accounts of the same event, was he wasting ink? Was he making a, a mistake and being redundant? Or was, was God giving you three different accounts sometimes that had differing details in order to give you pieces of a puzzle that you could put together and have a more complete understanding of what occurred. And it seems to me it's, that that's what's clearly happening. There's no wasted word in Scripture. Every word is exactly as it should be. Every word is there for a reason. And, and so what we need to do is the principle of studying cross-references gives greater clarity as to what the Holy Spirit is trying to teach. So I would, I would just encourage you in that regard. Next question, get Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4. And the question that we want to consider is this. In Luke 4, does the Lord... Stop reading in Isaiah 61 in the middle of a sentence because of the existence of the dispensation of grace. So I asked you to get Luke 4. Also get Isaiah 61. So keep, keep both of these passages. Get Isaiah 61, but also get Luke chapter 4. Now, before we dig into those, I want to show you something on the dispensational chart. So as we look at the chart, what I'm going to do for the moment is I'm going to hide the dispensation of grace. So if you look at the chart there with the dispensation of grace, for a moment I'm going to get rid of it. If you were in Acts chapter 8, so before Paul is saved in Acts chapter 9, if you're in Acts chapter 8 and someone said, draw the timeline of history as to what it looks like, it would look exactly like this. And the reason that it would look like this is that the dispensation of grace, according to Ephesians 3, 2 and 3, 3, is a mystery. And it was hid in God until the Lord revealed it to Paul. In other words, it was a secret. God knew of the dispensation of grace, but he did not reveal it to man. And so for all of recorded history prior to Acts 9, no one knows about the dispensation of grace other than God. So the timeline would look exactly like this. Now, you and I happen to live during the dispensation of grace after God has revealed it to the Apostle Paul. So when we look at the timeline do we understand the dispensation of grace? Yes, because God has made it known. Now, the question that's being asked is this. Let me ask it again. In Luke chapter 4, does the Lord stop reading in Isaiah 61 in the middle of a sentence because of the existence of the dispensation of grace? So look at Isaiah 61. You ready? Isaiah 61, and we're going to look at verses 1 and 2. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, 
and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all that mourn. So we read verses 1 and 2. Now keep Isaiah 61, but go with me to Luke 4, verse 16. Luke 4, 16. And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. That's Isaiah. It's just a translation from Greek into English, and that's why it's different, but that's Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Well, obviously the Lord is reading from the book of Isaiah, and obviously he's reading from Isaiah 61, because we just read Isaiah 61. So now let's look at this. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Now what the Lord does there, look back at Isaiah 61, keep both of them, but look at Isaiah 61. In Isaiah 61 too, where it says to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, it then has a comma and it says, and the day of vengeance of our God. So what the Lord does in in, in Luke 4 is he stands up to read, he gets Isaiah, he reads all of verse 1, he reads part of verse 2, and he stops right in the middle of the verse at a comma, not a period, at, at a comma. Now, look with me in Luke 4, verse 20. And he closed the book, and he gave it again to the minister and sat down. So he, he, he very abruptly stops right in the middle of verse 2, and not at a period, but a comma. Here's what the conventional, dispensational interpretation of the Lord's behavior is. What people will say is that in Isaiah 61, verse 1, and the first part of verse 2, all of that, up to and including to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, that was fulfilled during the Lord's earthly ministry. But the following phrase, the day of the vengeance of our God, was that fulfilled during the Lord's earthly ministry? It wasn't. That's not going to be fulfilled until when? It's going to be after the rapture during the 70th week, right? So the traditional interpretation is the Lord reads Isaiah 61, verse 1. He reads all the part that's going to be fulfilled during his earthly ministry. But the next part, which is going to be fulfilled 2,000 years in the future, he doesn't read. And he doesn't read that because, look, look with me at verse, let's read verse 20 and 21. So Luke 4, verses 20 and 21. And he closed the book, and he gave it again to the minister and sat down. And the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began to say unto them, This day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. So the traditional interpretation is the Lord stops in verse 2 because he's going to say this is being fulfilled and he has to stop before the part that's 2,000 years away because it's not going to be fulfilled at that time. Now I'm just going to give you my opinion. That explanation doesn't seem right to me. And here's why that doesn't seem right. If you take that explanation, then the Lord is stopping what he's doing and closing the book because of the existence of the dispensation of grace. Did Jesus Christ 
or anyone reveal or hint at the dispensation of grace before it was given to Paul? Can't be because it's a mystery hidden God. Get Ephesians 3.9. Ephesians 3.9. Get with me Ephesians 3 verse 9. And let, let's start in Ephesians 3.1 just to get some context. So Ephesians chapter 3 verse 1. For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles, if ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which is given me. Verse 2 specifically says that the dispensation of the grace of God was given to Paul. And that's the time period in which we live. Now notice verse 3, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery. So Paul didn't learn the mystery from any human being. He learned it because God revealed it to him. God revealed the mystery. The term mystery means hidden wisdom in 1 Corinthians 2, verses 7 and 8. So in other words, what God does when, when he makes known the dispensation of the grace of God to Paul, what God's doing is he's revealing a mystery. He's revealing something that was hidden up until that time. Look at verse 9. And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, notice, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God. So let's put those verses together. If, if from the beginning of the world, the mystery was hid in God, not in the Old Testament scriptures, but hid in God, and then the mystery was revealed to Paul, in between how many people knew it? It can only be zero. If it was hid in God until it was revealed to Paul, then in between how many people knew it? None. Now, does Ephesians 3 say that the mystery was hid in the Old Testament or that it was hid in God? It's clearly hid in God. Now, let me give you an example about secrets. What happens in human affairs, if you have something that's really juicy, what is human nature? Well, you want to tell it, right? And so what happens with human nature is sometimes you just can't help but hint at it. And then when you hint at it and someone asks you about it, oh, well, I wasn't planning on it, but I'll tell you. And that's the way human affairs work. And if you lived life for more than 13 seconds, you know that that's the way human nature works. Is that the way God works? Does God give little hints about things that he has determined to hide? He doesn't. Now look with me at Colossians 1, verse 25. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 25. Whereof I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. Again, the dispensation of God was given to Paul. Verse 26, even the mystery which hath been hid from ages and generations, except for a few hints here and there. That's not what it says. Which hath been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to the saints. So you can decide whether or not this is true. I am uncomfortable with the traditional dispensational explanation that what the Lord does in Luke 4 is he stops in the middle of the verse, closes the book, and he does that because the dispensation of grace is going to delay the event and so that's why he closes the book. Isn't that kind of hinting that there's something in there that's causing it not to be fulfilled? 
It seems to me there's a much better explanation, and here's what it is. Go back with me to Luke 4. Luke chapter 4, verse 20. And he closed the book, and he gave it again to the minister, and sat down. And the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. Now notice verse 21. And he began to say unto them, This day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. The reason why the Lord didn't read the rest of Isaiah 61 verse 2 is what he was doing in Luke 4 is he was saying this very day, Isaiah 61 verse 1 and the first part of verse 2 will be fulfilled. He was not suggesting that the day of the vengeance of our God was 2,000 years away, but it was 40 years away, right? So think with me, look at the chart again. If you're in Luke chapter 4, so that's about right here, what will happen is, let's go back to the, if you're in Luke chapter 4 right here, according to the traditional interpretation, the day of, the day of vengeance of our God is over here 2,000 years away. And so that's why the Lord closed the book. But what's really going on is this. If you're in Luke 4 right here, what happens is the, the day of the vengeance of our God is at the second coming, and it's going to be after the cross. It's going to be multiple years after the cross. It's going to be at the end of the 70th week. And he cannot say, this day is the scripture fulfilled. So the better way to, to read Luke 4, in my opinion, is it has nothing to do with the dispensation of grace. It has to do that during the Lord's earthly ministry, Isaiah 61 verse 1 and the first part of verse 2 were fulfilled that very day, and the latter part of verse 2 would be fulfilled after the cross, after the 70th week, but still within the lives of those then living, because the Lord says in the Gospels, this generation shall not pass away till all these things be fulfilled. So I'm going to suggest to you that's the better explanation. We'll do one more question. Get Mark 14, verse 61. Mark 14, verse 61. In Mark 14, 61 and 62, the Lord tells the high priest that he will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven. When is this verse fulfilled? So we're going to look at Mark 14, verse 61. Now, when we, when we dig into this, I'll give you this disclaimer that uh, I'm not 100% positive that what I'm going to share here is the right answer. And of course, on all these things, you know, all, all the, uh, every time you answer a question, it's to the best of your current knowledge. And do you have everything right? No, you don't. And there's things that you learn, and there's some things you just have wrong. So we're going to look at here what's the best of my understanding, and, and maybe it's wrong, and maybe I need to be taught. So we'll just, we'll just go with that. Mark 14, 61. But he held his peace and answered nothing. Again, the high priest asked him and said unto him, Art thou the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? And what's happening here is the Lord Jesus Christ is being interrogated by the high priest. Now notice verse 62, and Jesus said, I am, and ye shall see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. So the Lord says to the high priest, I am the Christ, and you're going to see me coming in the clouds of heaven. And the question that's being asked is, well, when did the high priest see him do that? Because, of course, now the high priest is dead and it hasn't happened, right? So get Matthew 26, 63. The first thing we want to do is 
look at parallel passages to see if those shed any light. So Matthew 26, 63. But Jesus held his peace, and the high priest answered and said unto him, I adjure thee by the living God, that thou tell us whether thou be the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus saith unto him, Thou hast said, Nevertheless I say unto you, Hereafter shall ye see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. Get Mark 13, verse 24. Mark chapter 13 and verse 24. But in those days, after that tribulation, the sun shall be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars of heaven shall fall, and the powers that are in heaven shall be shaken. Now notice this. And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. So Mark 13, this is not a reference to the Lord before the high priest, but the Lord makes a similar statement. And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. When the Lord says that in Mark 13, are those people that he's speaking to, are they alive today? And, and are they going to be alive on the earth at the time of the second coming? And the answer is no. So get Acts 7.55. So the problem that we have is the Lord makes these statements during his earthly ministry that the high priest and others will see the Son of Man coming with, with power and, and, and with the clouds of heaven, and yet those folks are all dead now. So did the verse not get fulfilled? Look at Acts 7.55. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God and said, Behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Well, in Acts 7, we see the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. But that can't be the fulfillment of what we were looking at because the high priest doesn't see it. Who sees it here? Stephen does. It doesn't say that anyone else sees it. So Acts 7 doesn't seem to be the solution to our problem. Okay, so get with me. Revelation chapter 1. And we're going to look at verse 7. So here's the problem we're trying to solve. The Lord during his earthly ministry, when he's interrogated by the high priest, he says to him that he is the Christ... And he follows it up by saying, Ye shall see the Son of Man, that's me, sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. And when I say me, I mean the Lord Jesus Christ there. In other words, he says, You're going to see me on the right hand of power coming in the clouds of heaven. Of course, the high priest is dead. So is that, was the Lord just wrong? Well, that's not it. Look at me at Revelation 1, verse 7. And, and here's what I think is the answer. Behold, he cometh with clouds. And that's exactly what Mark 14, 62 said, that he would come with the clouds of heaven. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him. Now, you may have thought, well, that's just a reference to every eye on the earth. Because what happens is the sign of the, of the Son of Man appears in heaven, and everyone that's on the earth sees the second coming. Well, it's a true statement that everyone on earth sees the second coming. But there's more than that. Keep reading. And every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him. So those that pierced him also see him. Those that pierced him are what today? They're dead, right? The Roman centurion that pierced him is dead. But according to that verse, and they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him, even so, amen. Get Psalm twenty-two sixteen. 16. Psalm chapter 22, 16. I want to show you the cross references here on piercing just to make sure we have a clear picture of it. Psalm 22 and verse 
16. For dogs have compassed me, the assembly of the wicked have enclosed me, they pierced my hands and my feet. What is that obviously a reference to? It's the cross, right? It's the Lord being pierced when he was nailed to the cross. Get with me John 19, verse 34. John chapter 19 and verse 34. John 19, 34. But one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side, and forthwith came there out blood and water. So the Lord is pierced multiple times during the crucifixion. His hands are pierced, his feet are pierced when he's nailed to the cross, and then his side is pierced, John 19, verse 34, while he is on the cross. Now, of the folks that, it, that performed those piercings, how many of them are alive today? Well, the answer obviously has to be zero. So how exactly do they see the Lord at the second coming? And my answer to that is somehow all of humanity, including the dead and those in hell, witness the second coming. Look with me at Matthew 24, verse 29. Matthew chapter 24, verse 29. Matthew chapter 24 and verse 29. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. Matthew 24, 29 describes the events immediately prior to the Lord's second coming. In other words, it's the end of the 70th week. And what happens in the universe, so just think about this for a minute. The sun is darkened and the moon doesn't give her light. If you just think about the recent eclipse, what, what would happen if the sun was darkened and the moon didn't give light? What, 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 would, what would happen on earth? I mean, it would be ridic It would be dark, dark, right? I mean, it would be ridiculously dark. And then it says, the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. So let me ask you this question. If those things happened, how many people on earth would take notice of it? You wouldn't be able to not know, right? So what happens in, in Matthew 24, 29, is there are these cosmic disturbances that take place that surely get the attention of every being on the earth. When the sun is darkened and the moon turned to blood and so on, everyone's going to know. Now notice verse 30. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. So God turns off the light on the earth, and then there's a sign of the Son of Man in heaven. How many people are going to see that? Everyone because it's going to be obvious. Everything is dark, but now you see the sign of the Son of Man. So everyone's going to notice that. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. So verse 30 makes absolutely clear that everyone on earth is going to witness the second coming. They'll see the Lord coming with power and, and the clouds and so on. But what I'm going to suggest to you is that the visibility extends beyond just those that are alive. So look with me at Revelation 19, verse 11. Revelation 19 and verse 11. Revelation 19 and verse 11. And I saw, notice this, heaven opened. And behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. 
Revelation 19 is a description of the second coming. But if you'll notice, the first thing that happens is that heaven is open. So there's some event that takes place in, in, in heaven that is so dramatic that the heavens are opened and people are able to, to witness that. Get with me Hebrews 12, verse 1. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 1. Hebrews 12, 1. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. So you can decide what you think about Hebrews 12, verse 1. I'm going to tell you what I think it says. When it says at the front of the verse, wherefore seeing we also are compassed about. What does the word compassed mean? Surrounded. And it says here, surrounded about with so great a cloud of witnesses. I think Hebrews 12, 1 tells you that at minimum, the saved who are dead witness the events that transpire on earth. We're surrounded with so great a cloud of witnesses. What happens at the second coming is God's desire is for the whole earth, those on the earth, as well as those that are departed, that are dead, to witness the second coming. That's the only way I can come up with that the high priest that speaks to the Lord in Matthew 26, and the Lord says to him that you're going to witness the second coming. Well, how does that happen? How, how do the, those that pierced him, how do they see the second coming? Because all of them are clearly dead. Well, they, they, they witness that because it's God's will that the whole universe have visibility as to the second coming. One of the things I, I, I would liken it to is, is this. When the verses speak of every knee shall bow, does that include both living and dead? It does because it's God's intent that all of humanity throughout all time, bow to the Lord Jesus Christ. That's going to happen. It seems it's also the case that it is God's desire that all humanity, living or dead, witness the second coming. So that, that's the, the, the best answer I know of to that question. Maybe there's a better one, but that's my uh, understanding. All right, we'll, we'll pause there and, and pick up next time. Let me close this in a word of prayer. Lord, we rejoice in, in your word. We rejoice in the, the powerful truths that it contains. And we just give you all the glory. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.